Welcome to The God Culture, where we urge you to challenge tradition, as 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We do not intend to be confrontational, but to compare what the Bible really says versus the traditions of men which Jesus himself rebuked. Jesus said to the Pharisees, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Mark 7, 9. Notice their own tradition and not God's. The oral tradition of the rabbis, the Pharisees, became the Talmud, so be very careful in using it to interpret the Bible or Torah. In our search for the God culture, we are finding that God established His own traditions that we ignore and we grasp onto man-made customs instead. He has provided many clues throughout the Bible and even the geography of the earth that as a culture we are programmed to ignore favoring man's ways and theology over God's. We are called to know the Bible for ourselves not from a 20-minute sermon when we attend church, but to spend time understanding the all-knowing God's wisdom over man's limited and often perverted knowledge. Although we are not attempting to offend anyone, as this is done in love, we warn you that we will tell the truth as we find it, and we will withhold nothing from you. So listen as we attempt to prove all things, and we encourage you to prove them for yourself. This teaching is the first of our Solomon's Gold series. The evidence is so overwhelming and abundant that this subject requires an entire series as the Bible and recorded history provide many clues which completely obliterate most traditional views and answer most of the questions many scholars seem to overlook. This is why it is your responsibility to read and study the Bible for yourself, so you cannot be deceived even by well-meaning people. Jeremiah 33.3 says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and shew you great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. And Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. The Bible was not meant to be absorbed in sound bites, and the modern approach to scholarship is ineffective because we do not take the time to really understand the Bible. Even though if you read a few passages before or after, or parallel passages, it often interprets itself. God has planted hints everywhere, and this account is a perfect example. As you will see, this topic progresses to the clarifying of our understanding in many different arenas, leading all the way back to the river that flowed from Eden, correcting the journey of Jonah, and setting straight once and for all the occult-ridden, accepted story of the Queen of Sheba. Through these twists and turns, you will discover the ancient land of Solomon's gold, which has just recently begun fulfilling Jesus' prophecy regarding its place in the last days. This is exciting, so hold on to your seat and get ready for a wild ride of truth, as this land is no myth, but is real as the nose on your face. Our journey begins in Tel Kassil, modern-day Tel Aviv, Israel, in 1946, just after World War II. An archaeological dig discovered an ancient pottery shard with an inscription. It was written in Hebrew around 1000 BC and reads... Gold of Ophir, two, or four, Beth Haran, 30 shekels. This evidence confirms the physical existence of the land of gold called Ophir. 
as well as 2 Chronicles 8.5, crediting Solomon with the building of Beth Haran. The historians who try to say Solomon never existed just simply have not bothered to look for any evidence. But how does this tie together? 1 Kings 9, 26-28 And King Solomon made a navy of ships in his Yan Kabir, which is beside Eloth, on the shore of the Red Sea, in the land of Edom. And Hiram sent in the navy his servants, shipmen that had knowledge of the sea, with the servants of Solomon. And they came to Ophir and fetched from thence gold, four hundred and twenty talents, and brought it to King Solomon. Note, Solomon built a new navy just to go to Ophir. Hiram, king of Tyre, which is in Phoenicia, led the navy for Solomon, which also had Solomon's servants from Israel serving with him. But Solomon had kings of foreign lands bringing him gold every year. Why would he need to acquire more gold? Because in building portions of God's temple, Solomon wanted to use the best gold. Ezion Gabir was on the Red Sea on the east side of the Sinai Peninsula. Wait, if Solomon wanted to go west... Wouldn't he have used one of Tyre's already existing ports on the Mediterranean Sea? Or even build one in Israel on the Mediterranean as well? No. The wisest man who ever lived would not have increased his trip by more than four times in order to go around Africa to get to the west when he could have used existing ports to go there. No. He was heading east. Here is a map of the traditional view that Phoenicia, which includes Tyre, only traded around the Mediterranean Sea. But we already know there is both physical and biblical evidence that they also sailed east from the Red Sea to Ophir. We are just getting started. Scholars also have great difficulty in realizing that the son of Cush, whom he named Sheba, is a different person from the son of Joktan, who also bore the name Sheba. The same goes for Havilah, as there is one from Cush and one from Joktan. However, there is only one Ophir named in the table of nations from Noah. And we will prove that he and his brothers, Sheba and Havilah, all sons of Joktan, not Cush, lived in the same region, and it was not even remotely close to Saudi Arabia, where Cush's sons, Sheba and Havilah, live. It's like saying all Johns live on the island of Patmos. Well, it would be easier to remember everyone's name, I guess. Now, using such scholarly logic, all pigs come from the land of Ham. We're pretty sure that is not a true statement. What was this gold of Ophir used for? Building Solomon's temple. As even David began acquiring the gold of Ophir and knew its value. 1 Chronicles 29.4 Even three thousand talents of gold of the gold of Ophir, and seven thousand talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the houses withal. This is the passage where David donated three thousand talents of his own personal treasury to the temple project. This gold also came from Ophir. We are not suggesting that Solomon did not use any other gold other than that of Ophir, but the Bible calls out Ophir for a reason. Now, Ophir was actually a person listed in the table of nations after the flood. Yes, God put all those begats in there as clues in which we may form a proper perspective on many topics. We'll spend a little time there laying the foundation in this introduction. Genesis 10, 26-30 
And Joktan begot all these guys, 13 sons in all, the most of anyone listed in the table of nations. That's of special note. But he begot Sheba and Ophir and Havilah and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan. And their dwelling was from Mesha as thou goest unto Sephar, a mount of the east. For the sake of time, Genesis 10 also lays out that Joktan was son of Eber, which is where we get the name Hebrew, who was son of Arphaxad, son of Shem, son of Noah. So he was Shem's grandson, great-grandson. Note that this passage clarifies that Ophir, Sheba, and Havilah are sons of Joktan. When we talk about Sheba later, you will see this is a crucial point to the understanding of the account of the Queen of Sheba. There is no fear in any of these other lines in the Table of Nations, just in Joktan's, and this also is critical. Also, notice the Bible is clear. They lived from Misha and headed east from there. After the dispersion of the Tower of Babel, the sons of Eber, Joktan and his brother Peleg, separated at Misha. Joktan headed east. Peleg headed west and fathered the Israelites through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Joktan is never heard of again throughout the Bible, or is he? Misha is the origin from ancient Hebrew of a place in Iran called Mashad, which is the beginning of the Silk Road to the Orient. Misha means departure, because it is where Joktan departed from the caravan with Peleg. In Persian, Mashad, or Meshed, when using it as an adjective, means resembling a network, or interlocked and interacting. Mashad was the beginning of Joktan's network to the east, and I'm sure from there they networked with the west as it became a trade route within the Silk Road to the east. Let's look at this on a map. Notice where Ezion Gabir is on the Red Sea, and match the fact that Ophir and his brothers headed east from the western tip of Iran. Again, they did not head west. Just wait till you see where this leads. But first, who else knew about the gold of Ophir? Job, who lived hundreds of years before David and Solomon wrote, Then shalt thou lay up gold as dust, and the gold of Ophir as the stones of the brooks. Later he writes, It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir, with the precious onyx or the sapphire. So Job knew of Ophir hundreds of years before Solomon, and that the land of Ophir had gold that was good, the most precious. And Isaiah knew of the precious gold of Ophir. Isaiah thirteen twelve. Then I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. David knew of Ophir before Solomon reigned. King's daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Ophir. It was the gold that queens wore. We also know from earlier that David contributed 3,000 talents to the temple project. From his own personal treasury, he gave 3,000 talents of the gold of Ophir. He knew that gold of Ophir was good, but he also knew that the gold of Sheba was good as well, which we will prove in a later segment is the same land as Ophir. David writes, And he shall live, and to him shall be given of the gold of Sheba. We will provide much greater 
proof of this synergy. But before that, there are more clues. So how far did they go? Did you know the Bible tells us how far they traveled? 2 Chronicles 9.21 says, For the king's ships, Solomon's, went to Tarshish, Ophir, with the servants of Haram, Hiram, king of Tyre. Every three years, once came the ships of Tarshish, bringing gold, silver, ivory, and apes and peacocks. Apes and peacocks? All of these resources provide further clues, which we will deal with later. So it was a three-year round-trip journey to go to Ophir. This is a massive hint. Wouldn't Ethiopia or, say, Yemen, which are on the Red Sea, be a trip taking just weeks, not three years? Of course they are. They went much further, as we will prove. It has been suggested by some scholars that Tarshish may actually be a wood that the ships were made of, and not a place. But this passage is clear. They went to a place known as Tarshish. And when it mentions the ships of Tarshish, it is clearly referring to the place Tarshish, not a wood. Where do the ships of Tarshish go for these resources? They go to the land of Ophir. Because 1 Kings 22.48 says, Jehoshaphat made ships of Tarshish to go to Ophir for gold. But they went not, for the ships were broken up at Ezion Gebir. There it is again. This was 100 years after Solomon. Jehoshaphat tried to rebuild Solomon's navy to go to Ophir, for gold, but was unsuccessful. Nevertheless, we know the ships of Tarshish go to Ophir. It matters not whether the passage has an extra H, which is rather common in biblical translation, but instead that the ships of Tarshish and Tarshish, same pronunciation, both go to Ophir. Why build at Ezion Gebir on the Red Sea and not the Mediterranean just like Solomon, to go east to Ophir. We're going to whip through some other supporting scriptures, as there are many. Psalm 48, 7, Thou breakest the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. Why east? Because the ships of Tarshish go to Ophir, which is in the east. But wait, there's more. Jeremiah 10.9, silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish. Ezekiel 27.12, Tarshish was thy merchant by reason of the multitude of all kind of riches. With silver, iron, tin, and lead, they traded in thy fares. Tarshish is in the same area, and its resources are much the same as Ophir. Isaiah 60 verse 9 says, Surely the isles shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish first, to bring thy sons from far, their silver and their gold with them. It's rather inept to say that Tarshish is Tartessus, Spain, when it's not even an island, whether alone isles. Yet, this is the common position of many scholars according to Wikipedia. Not to mention the ships of Tarshish go east from the Red Sea port, not west. Don't worry, we will get to the story of Jonah and the whale, in which the geography of the traditional position of Tarshish doesn't even make logical sense, nor does it add up. We will cover this in an entire video, setting the story of Jonah straight. Ezekiel 38.13, Sheba and Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish, with all its villages, will say to you, Have you come to capture spoil? Have you assembled your company to seize plunder, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to capture great spoil? Sheba and Dedan are in the same area as Tarshish and Ophir. How could this be? 
Sheba is brother of Ophir, as we saw earlier. And Dedan is brother of Tarshish, as you will see, along with other scriptural support. The land of Ophir is made up of several territories rich in resources. We will vet this out further, but are there more clues as to the direction of Ophir? 2 Chronicles 3 verses 6 and 7 says, Further he adorned the house, the first temple of Solomon, with precious stones, and the gold was gold from Parvaim. He also overlaid the house with gold, the beams, the thresholds, and its walls, and its doors, and he carved cherubim on the walls. Hold on, was God confused? We read earlier that the temple was overlaid with the gold of Ophir, and now it says Parvaim? This is a clue that God planted for us to find. Parvaim is not a city or an island. It's a direction. Smith's Bible Dictionary defines the Hebrew word Parvaim as Oriental regions, derived from Sanskrit purva, Orient, or Eastern, and is a general term for the East. God is giving us directions. Could there be more? Here we go again. Jeremiah 10.9 Silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish, and gold from Upaz, the work of the workmen and of the hands of the founder. Blue and purple is their clothing. They are all the work of cunning men. Daniel 10.5 And Daniel's vision. Daniel writes, Then I lifted up mine eyes, and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Upaz. God does it again. Upaz is defined as fine gold, gold of Pisan. Wait, I remember Pisan as one of the rivers that flowed from the river from Eden. In Genesis 2, verses 10 through 12, And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pisan. There you go. That is it which compasseth, surrounds, the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is Delium and the onyx stone. Ah, Havila, the ancient land of gold. Havila was also the name of the brother of Ophir, who was likely named after and went in search of the ancient land of resources, Havila, with his brothers, Ophir and Sheba. Remember our base scripture, Sheba, Ophir, and Havila were all brothers, sons of Joktan, who headed east from Misha, Mashad, Iran. But is there a tie that would bind them as settling together? There is an extra biblical source. The Kitab al-Magal, I probably said it wrong, and the Cave of Treasures hold that in the early days after the Tower of Babylon, the children of Havilah, son of Joktan, built a city and kingdom which was near to those of his brothers, Sheba and Ophir. Havilah, Sheba, Ophir settled in the same land, the land of ancient resources in which Havilah was named. This is why Job, David, and Solomon knew the gold of this land was good. Who knows? The Bible does not actually specify where Noah or Adam's generations actually lived before the flood and after the fall. Perhaps Adam moved to Havilah, land of resources. It makes sense, and we will discuss this later. There's zero evidence that Adam lived in Israel, nor anywhere near it. The land of Israel was chosen because of Abraham's righteousness, not because of the landscape and the geography. 
Solomon had kings bringing him gold. Why did he have to build a navy and send ships all the way to Ophir? Because Ophir is God's original land of gold, Havilah, and we will prove this. Moses made sure to mention Havilah in Genesis as the only river from Eden defined by its resources, the Pisan. Adam and his generations knew this, and so did Noah, as they probably lived there rather than the desert. Remember, we are stupid, de-evolved humans next to Adam and Noah. Imagine what we learn in 900 plus years on this earth as they did. And Adam probably survived in the garden even longer. We don't know. They were the originals, perfect in their intellect. And we are merely de-evolved copies of those originals. This is why we fall for Bible charts, which cannot even figure out that people of the same name may actually have lived in different areas of the world or why we have bought into occult science and occult history for so many years. Noah and Adam knew better. It took the guardian cherub in the Garden of Eden to fool Eve. He fools you and I through simple suggestions and manipulations, because he doesn't have to approach us directly. While we're in the table of nations, let us match up a few more details of this account of Ophir and its provinces. Genesis 10.2 The sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Medai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshech, and Tyrus. Tyrus, as in the maritime kingdom of Tyre in Phoenicia, the one that we've been discussing where Hiram came from? Of course. You mean the brother of Javan, who had the maritime sons, Oh, yes, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. They were the sons of the Isles. Genesis 10, 4 and 5. And the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. By these were the Isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families in their nations. So, this is how the sons of Javan joined the sons of Joktan, who headed east. They caught up later in their search for the land of resources, Havilah, but Ophir, Sheba, and Havilah had already rediscovered it. Here is where the name Tarshish came from, and there are other areas of trade mentioned in different accounts of Tyre, suggesting partners with the Isles of Elisha, Kittim, and Dodan, Dedan, as well. Contrary to most historians, boating did not begin thousands of years later. They took to the seas quickly after the flood. We even have actual archaeological finds of ocean-going vessels, which we will show you dating back to before Solomon's day. Ezekiel 37 provides trading partners of Tyre. Here are a few excerpts. In verse 6, benches of ivory brought out of the isles of Kittim. Funny, Kittim is supposed to be a town on the island of Cyprus, according to some scholars. Problem, Kittion is a town... Not even the island. The island is Cyprus and has been named that for thousands of years. And this passage says, the isles of Kittim, not just one island. Verse 7, blue and purple from the isles of Elisha. Again, scholars have no idea where these isles are, but it's not just one island or just a town. The men of Dedan, verse 15, were thy merchants. Many isles were thy merchandise of thine hand. They brought you for a present horns of ivory and ebony. Dedan, or Dodan, took to the seas and founded many 
isles, just as the table of nations told us that all of the sons of Javan are the founders of the islands of the Gentiles, which would be all of the islands in the earth, pretty much. Yemen is not an island, by the way. They continue to bury ancient man to a small confined area of the Middle East, and it extends outward from there. It is simply just not what the Bible says, nor history. Did you know that the Bible tells us who divided the entire earth? Not just the known world, the entire earth after the flood. Genesis 10.32 These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. Noah's generations divided the entire earth, not just the Middle East area or the known world at the time. Noah was 600 years old and smarter than us and came from a society that clearly was worldwide prior to the flood, as we found similar architecture and uh, hieroglyphs all over the earth that have uh, much in common. We know that that just doesn't make sense. They did not wait until the Roman, Greek, or Persian empires, and most especially not the Europeans, to begin boating. This is why when Columbus discovered America, there were already people there, meaning he discovered nothing. It was already discovered. Same with the Spanish who discovered the Philippines, an ancient land far older than the nation of Spain. This is a backwards mindset, which holds us back. In fact, the Bible even tells us when the earth was divided by the table of nations. Genesis 10, 25. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of the first was Peleg. For in his days was the earth divided. And his brother's name was Joktan, who we've been talking about. How could they divide the earth in just four generations? Because they had boats and explored the entire world world, especially looking for Havila, the lost land of gold and resources, of course. Isaiah 41, verses 1 and 2. Keep silence before me, O islands, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near, meaning they're far. Then let them speak. Let us come near together to judgment, key word, who raised up the righteous man from the east. Verse 3, he had not gone with his feet. Why? Because he went by boat. Verse 5, the isles saw it and feared. The ends of the earth were afraid and drew near and came. Where are the isles? East, far to the ends of the earth. They are righteous men who stand in judgment. Wait, this too sounds all too familiar to something Jesus said. Matthew 12, 42, Jesus prophesies, The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. A parallel verse in Luke 11.31 reads, She came from the utmost parts of the earth. Same thing. Dude, Jesus just busted the move. If Sheba was in Ethiopia or Yemen, would that have been considered uttermost or utmost parts of the earth in Jesus' day? We will show you actual maps from that era. When Jesus was speaking, that include the Pacific Islands at the ends of the earth, by the way. Jesus knew what he was talking about. But here's another scripture. Isaiah 42.10 Sing unto the Lord a new song, 
and his praise from the ends of the earth. Ye that go down south to the sea, and all that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof. Wait a minute. Isles to the south at the ends of the earth who love to sing. Who could this be? You'll see. But here's more support from Scripture. Jeremiah 25, 22, 23. And all the kings of Tyrus and all the kings of Sidon and the kings of the isles which are beyond the sea, Dedan and Tima and Buzz, and all that are in the utmost corners. The isles that are beyond the sea, you say? In the utmost corners? Jeremiah 31.10 Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off. Isles afar off? Do you see a pattern here? They are talking about the special land, the isles of Ophir which we will prove is ancient Havilah, land of gold and resources. Psalm 97.1 Let the multitude of isles be glad thereof. Ezekiel 27.3 And say unto Tyrus, O thou that art situate at the entry of the sea, meaning Ezion Gebir, which are the merchant of the people of for many isles. So we have multitude of isles. We have many isles. These are all clues of Ophir, and there are even more scriptures we will not include in this session. So, we know Ophir is a real life land of good gold, Delium and Onyx, after the flood, whose resources were used to build Solomon's temple. Named after Ophir, son of Joktan, who headed east into the Orient, which was a three-year journey for Solomon's navy, who lived near his brothers Sheba and Havilah. These were not Cush's, Ham's sons, but descended from Shem and Eber, Hebrew. Ophir is where the ships of Tarshish travel to get good gold the best gold, was referred to as the Isles, afar off, beyond the sea, many, multitude of islands, where Javan's maritime sons, Tarshish, Kittim, Dedan, Dodan, and Elisha, also settled, likely in search of Havilah, because it was the ancient land of resources since the days of the Garden of Eden, which we will prove. We also know Ophir is the land of post-flood gold and resources. Sheba is in the land of Ophir, and we'll prove this further. Parvaim is in the direction of Ophir, orient, east. Upaz is Ophir, because it's the gold of the Pisan River, Havila. Tarshish, Kittim, Dedan, and Elisha are in the land of Ophir. Havila was the land of pre flood gold, now known as Ophir. So we are looking for a place with lots of islands, with lots of names, three years' journey to the east of the Red Sea beyond the Arabian Sea, known as the Indian Ocean today, surrounded by an ancient river that had the resources acquired by Solomon's navy, that has Hebrew hints hidden in its culture, whose history has been erased. We hope you enjoyed this reflection, and always remember to prove all things. Thank you for watching. Watch our progressive Solomon's Gold series on our YouTube channel or at thegodculture.com.